looking back a quarter of a century over my work at the Hopkins, uh, it seems necessary to point out what I was trying to do during those years. And much of it revolved around a special aspect of psychiatry which I tried to teach, which is talking with patients. This is one of the respects in which the work of psychiatrists differs most from that of other physicians because of the need to talk things over at greater length with psychiatric patients. Uh, the teaching of this matter to students and even to young psychiatrists had not been much attempted. Uh, the task of uh, trying to expound some principles of interviewing was one of the first tasks that I set myself to when I began earnestly to teach psychiatry. And uh, this was one of my main efforts in the uh, early days of teaching at Hopkins in the 40s. Uh, published a paper dealing with this matter, and of course reprints were made available for students and house staff. But I think the most uh, significant ways in which I sat about trying to teach this was by interviewing patients in the presence of uh, uh, young doctors on the staff and students, not to highlight the symptoms of the patients, but to have a useful conversation with the patient. This was the substance uh, on which the te teaching was based, as well as being, uh, you might say, the example which some might follow in their own talks with patients. Uh, it would be of uh, I would also have to explain uh, how I came to see this as a central part of psychiatry. And to explain that, I'd have to go back even further before I ever came near Hopkins and explain that for a good many years I was busy in a biochemical laboratory where uh, I came to do some studies of uh, uh, glucose and phosphate metabolism because I found there were among the patients quite a few who seemed a great deal lacking in energy and one of the possible ways of influencing their energy metabolism constructively seemed to be to give them extra amounts of glucose and sodium acid phosphate. So some patients of uh, very inert and uh, uh, energy type were selected by clinical people on the staff falling within the category which uh, in those days were called dementia precox. And an effort was made by giving them glucose and sodium acid phosphate and following their metabolism in the biochemical laboratory to see if they could be made to show a little more energy. Well, unexpectedly, some of these patients began to do much better and got well. Uh, this uh, was uh, called for an explanation. And uh, some control experiments were done to see if uh, it was the glucose or if it was the sodium acid phosphate or whether some other factors might be significant in their improvement. It happened that uh, uh, two of these patients came around to thank me for my talking with them. And here I should explain that uh, biochemistry in those days was uh, all done by the same person. You gave the glucose, you gave the sodium acid phosphate, you took the blood, you did the laboratory test. You didn't have as many assistants as people have in more modern times so that I had gotten acquainted with these patients and had talked with them. Not in any formal interview way, but just 
to get acquainted and to talk with them, whatever they wanted to talk about. Uh, and uh, uh, in the light of these fellows who came to thank me for the talk, it seemed useful to do a control study on conversation, leaving out the glucose and the sodium acid phosphate. And when this was done, the control series showed more of these improvements than either of the other series. So I had a real problem then. How does it work that conversation seems more useful to patients than some deliberate plans to change their metabolism? Uh, this uh, put my attention on the phenomenon which I later talked about as the interview and uh, led me to do uh, quite a lot of personal experimentation in different ways of talking with patients. And uh, yeah, out of this, and before I became a professor of psychiatry, I had developed uh, uh, quite a lot of material to talk about, which I talked about with the other doctors. I suppose it was on the basis of my presentations and discussions along this line that uh, I was invited to go to Washington University to be a professor of psychiatry, and then three years later to Johns Hopkins when Adolf Meyer retired. One of the matters which was of great interest to me during the years that I worked in the Henry Phipps Psychiatric Clinic at the Johns Hopkins Hospital was the study of uh, physicians and how they dealt with patients and what influence this had on the improvement of patients. Uh, there's been a great deal that's been written in general and in the abstract about what's called psychotherapy, what the doctor does in his conversation with patients to help the patient get better. Um, my concern was not so much to study the theory but to see what were the facts. And uh, for this purpose, at one time, we uh, made a list of the young doctors on the staff. Uh, we made a list of uh, the improvement rates in their patients, uh, sorting them out into three categories of patients, uh, neurotic patients, depressed patients, and schizophrenic patients. The neurotic patients in general have a pretty good chance of improvement anyway. Depressed patients could be said to have a pretty, well, nearly 100% chance of improvement if they last through the depression. Schizophrenic patients are not traditionally supposed to have so good prospects of improvement. Uh, the lists that showed how well their patients did were different for these doctors uh, depending upon the type of patient. We focused primarily upon schizophrenic patients because uh, if uh, any considerable number of them, any large proportion, get well, there uh, probably is a reason for it since in general they are not expected to do well. Well, we selected after preliminary studies uh, a few over a hundred patients and their doctors divided approximately half and a half, a half of them being the patients of uh, the doctors who were in the lowest group on our score and half of them patients of doctors who were in the highest group in our score. Those in the lowest group had a 27% improvement rate and those in the upper group had a 75% improvement rate. We uh, uh, studied all the material that we had available regarding how these doctors had interacted with their patients, trying to find out in a practical way what seemed to make a difference. Those who had low improvement rates uh, were in some respects easier to characterize. We found uh, among them uh, some who were operating in a highly permissive way, uh, their patients didn't do very well. Uh, some who were uh, interpreting 
trying to teach the patients by interpreting to them the meaning of their behavior, and their improvement rates were not, in general, very large. Among the group who had good improvement rates, 75% uh, doctors, uh, we found a fairly consistent picture of uh, doctors who uh, would express their own opinions if asked, who would sometimes volunteer their thoughts, but were not overly directive or domineering of the patients, yet reacted with them, responded and talked about problems that were brought up. Uh, this pattern of uh, uh, real interaction, uh, a willingness to stick one's neck out, express an opinion, and yet not trying to domineer in the situation, seemed in general to represent uh, the attitude which uh, produced the best results. We were doing at the time a good many uh, tests on the doctor population, psychological tests and various types, trying to characterize them by these means. Uh, at one time, Dr. Betts and I worked out a scheme uh, which uh, uh, enabled us, surprisingly enough, by psychological test in advance to designate which doctors would have uh, higher improvement rates with schizophrenic patients and which would have the lower improvement rates with schizophrenic patients. We uh, uh, took a group of doctors at one time and did such tests on them after we'd worked the matter out on the previous population, uh, put our predictions in the icebox, and then waited to see how well the results of the labors of those doctors would agree with the predictions. Again, I must say that this was with schizophrenic groups of patients. We had in one such batch, covering about another 100 patients, uh, predictions better than 80% correct for doctors in the high improvement rate group, and we had about 75% correctness in designated doctors whose results would be in the low improvement percentage group. Uh, it seemed reasonable to interpret this to mean that the doctor was quite a significant factor in whether or not the schizophrenic patients that he had would or would not show improvement. Uh, <clears throat> and it was possible to make some sense out of the psychological tests which designated these doctors as whether they would be in the group who had high improvement rates with schizophrenic patients and those who had low improvement rates. I couldn't undertake to recall now all the details of these tests, but uh, the most significant differentiator was what is known as the strong vocational interest blank. It is a paper and pencil test in which people record their interests and their likes and dislikes and preferences has been used to assist college students in selecting careers according to their responses to these patterns and how they agree with the likes and dislikes of people in various occupational groups. Uh, speaking as I am to some possible future audience, I think it might be necessary to explain uh, what a department head did in those old days when I was a department head at the Hopkins, because it may be different. Uh, it was a very busy life. One had the triad, the classical triad of teaching, research, service to patients. But on top of that was a great deal of activity concerned with the administration of a department, choices of uh, associates and those who were no longer going to be associates, uh, the raising of funds to budget 
the department and a considerable number of uh, committees both within the university and outside the university. Uh, these took up a great deal of time, particularly in the war period and immediately thereafter. I remember in uh, 51, I believe it was, my secretary pointed out to me that in one two-week period, I was supposed to attend 42 committee meetings and had actually attended 11. Uh, from that time on, I began to cut down on committees. Uh, but this is difficult, and uh, one is pressed into many activities which it's very hard to uh, say no to. The National Research Council was one place where I was on numerous committees. We had, during the wartime, a neuropsychiatry committee, which was very busy with uh, uh, revising the qualifications for people for service in the armed forces. Uh, I served on a commission to serve the war, the army, uh, in the study of combat exhaustion, which required a trip to Europe when the fighting was going on there. We had, uh, as I say, uh, scores and scores of committees, boards, commissions, and so forth. Uh, psychiatry was in a period of considerable expansion, and this required a lot of committee work to assist universities in obtaining professors to discuss the changes in education, in psychiatry, and in medicine. So uh, these, what you might call outside activities, uh, played a large part in uh, the work of the head of a department. 